Thank you. Thank you, dear friends. And uh, thank you, Hanna Yablonka, for saying goodbye to me. I assure you I still count to be for some time with you. Uh, Uh, well, uh, the title of today's uh, panel is Building a Better World, the Legacy of the Survivors and Celebrating Israel in the 60th Year. I have called my presentation Icon of Loss. Icon of Loss? But it is about my art. In it I shall speak of the famous photo of the Warsaw Ghetto Boy, an iconic image that appears in many of my recent paintings. Between the title of today's panel and the subject of my current work, there seems to be a disconnect. Um, in fact, when I began preparing this talk, I wondered, should an event that is celebrating Israel's birth and legacy be presented with the figure of a child that so blatantly evokes the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto? rather than drawing attention to the most poignant symbol of loss, of mourning, and perpetual fear of annihilation, a child that surrenders to death, wouldn't it be better to speak of rebirth, of resilience, of accomplishments? After all, I have the privilege of a long artistic career, and as you heard before, Yad Vashem gave me a large retrospective that just closed about a year, a year and a half ago. But it so happens that this specific subject is very, very dear to my heart. These, uh, uh, those who are familiar with my art know that I am an artist who mostly asks questions and rarely offers answers. When I first considered the topic I have chosen for today, I was filled with doubt. But within moments, my thoughts wandered off from this celebration to other Jewish celebrations. And I thought of the glasses, for instance, that people break at Jewish weddings, or the unfinished corners of walls in new houses, symbolic reminders of the destruction of the temple, and instantly my uncertainty was gone. My answer was, yes, I'll speak of the boy. What could be more Jewish than that? Indeed, let's speak of the boy. And I shall leave alone the other children, distraught mothers of the, in that photo, the German soldiers with pointed guns, and all the additional participants in this famous picture. I noticed how poignantly the figure of the boy remained detached from the crowd, dedicated to him, and to them are innumerable essays, research papers, and books I personally know few writers who are writing books on that very specific subject and have already published some books on that subject. An ever-growing field of exploration. But mine is a separate chapter. Today I shall try to direct our attention to the Warsaw boy in my paintings. So first let us make a leap of 60 years and land in the newborn state of Israel in the summer of 1948. The war of independence is still raging a rusted vessel named Pan York docks in the port of Haifa. It brings with it an overspilling shipload of Holocaust survivors. Its deck is packed with thousands of excited faces, gesticulating hands, and among them am I, a boy of 15. We have just completed a seemingly interminable voyage on this former Cuban banana carrier which treated its human cargo as if it were lifeless merchandise, hardly allowing us any space to move or air to breathe, generously providing collective seasickness, daily dishwater soup, overcrowded toilets, and forever crying babies. But people rarely complained. We were the chosen ones. We had survived the Shoah. We were the privileged participants of an unprecedented historical event. The hardships of our grueling voyage were accepted with understanding, even joy. Few observed. Few observers realized that in the hold of the Pan York, together with me, 
my mother, my stepfather, and thousands of other olim from DP camps traveled many thousands of ghosts, perhaps millions of ghosts. They dwelt among us survivors in our humble and hastily erected houses on legs like st of stills of concrete. We had places we could call home. We had a promise of life, and that was great. But I had to learn to live with the ghosts of my stepfather's two daughters and his first wife, and he, a traumatized survivor of Dachau, had to put up with the shadow of my mother's beloved first husband, the father I lost when I was ten. And besides them, we had the ghosts of my grandparents, the one of my best childhood friend, Samek Epstein, and many others. Such arrangements were normal. Most of our neighbors lived with the entire population of lost parents, lost siblings, lost children. We did our best to look like perfect families. We pretended to radiate resilience and contentment. This was the order of the day. Our honor was at stake. And although there was a cloud over our, over our heads, because we were the representatives of the six millions of victims that had allowed themselves to be slaughtered like sheep. You said it. Yes, this was, this was a literal voicing of a popular reproach. We never gave up the imperative to reestablish our credentials. We knew that the miracle of a Jewish state was at stake. So for the terrible weight of our collective loss, it had to be buried deep, deep inside. It should wait. Anyway, there were no tools to deal with it. The ghosts who lived with us became our silent partners. And we knew that we would pass them on to the future generation. And you just heard about it before. The Israeli society of the 50s, which was keeping a lid on the pain of the Shoah, didn't make it easy on me. It took me years to integrate my sense of bereavement and to live with it in peace. Luckily, the passing of time brought some appeasement. Wandering from country to country, living partially in Israel, partially in various European states, and now in the US, my acute sense of loss turned into a vital part of my inner self. What I would call my creative being has found ways to liberate its grief. I painted and painted and painted. I also wrote a, a book and other texts. I had countless shows, countless publications. Looking back at my entire life, I can conclude that my last 65 years of the 75 I am now have been an ongoing therapy an experience that I surely share with many other artists. But I would like to believe that it was more than that, that my art is more than a mere process of getting me to feel better. Fortunately, there are many people who believe in my art and reinforce in me this hope. I have arrived to my present mode of expression in the mid-60s. After years of stylistic searching, that included a period of youthful expressionism and a later period of abstraction. My so-called mature style explores a kingdom of metaphors, icons, symbols. Most of the symbols I use are easily, very easily recognizable. Many of them are Jewish. Often the banality of many of these symbols I use challenges my imagination, indeed. I take the symbols that allow me to tell my stories and under the appearance of a classical style, I incorporate them into my paintings. I try to speak of things I regard as important. The quasi-realism of my pictorial language enables me to communicate thoughts and perplexities, painful remembrances, and even deep hurts. The final result of all this toil is a huge collection of works, a few hundred one-man shows and the unmistakable life of a wandering Jew, which I assume with pride. So, after the Star of David, uh, the tablets, keys, trees and tombstones, came to me the figure of the Warsaw boy. 
In the last two or three decades, numerous historians, theologians, and educators found, found much interest in the use of my pictorial language as a visual means of teaching the history of the Holocaust. My seemingly otherworldly paintings, packed with catastrophic debris and uh, decipherable enigmas, permit them to show that history is not a chronicle of shattering facts, but also a moral and psychological phenomenon, one that holds far-reaching implications. It goes without saying that I feel very privileged to have contributed to such endeavors. I had some occasions to observe how young people interacted with the teachers who showed them images of my art and asked for their reaction. I spoke with many students at museums of university that had set up my shows. I saw how the, how the adolescent and inexperienced, at times innocent and naive souls, try to grasp the extremes of human behavior, the irrevocability of crucial choices, and man's potential to do good or evil. Thus, my various symbols, and among them the Warsaw boy, became part of their learning process. And this wasn't a matter of aesthetics. My art was being used to awaken their capacity of perception, touch their feelings, bring them historical enlightenment, arouse their reflection, and trigger discussions. I have seen how young people, whether Caucasian, Afro-American, or Asian, identify with the Warsaw boy. For them, he isn't an exclusively Jewish emblem, rather a signal of a timely warning on a universal scale. Also, I perceive in him an iconic dimension, not unlike the images and sounds that are parts of what I imagine as being the building blocks of our civilization, which to me remains ageless. For instance, the names of Bach, Mozart, or Beethoven belong to that kind. I cannot imagine an epoch of, in history without their music. I tell myself that their music must have existed since time immemorial. All they had to do was to open their respective shutters in their inner ear, and that is the feeling I have when I look at the photo of the Warsaw boy. On one hand, I know that it is an uncontested symbol of the Jewish Holocaust, and it was a finger of a Nazi officer that had opened the shutter of a camera's inner eye and immortalized a Jewish child. But on the other hand, I believe that this boy's grandeur comes from and belongs to eternity. And the reason is that human history is a cruel enterprise. For endless centuries, children have been savagely sacrificed and fallen victims to unimaginable genocides, to brutal wars, and to tribal feuds. Such horrors happened before the time of the Warsaw boy, after his time, and they all go on happening now, all over the world. Was this the way I perceived the photo when I first saw it published? True, it instantly seized my attention with its transcending force. I also remember that I carefully examined the entire group of participants as if they were players in a passion play, frozen in postures that made up an unexpected perfection of pictorial composition. But it was the lonely figure of the boy that sank deep into my heart. I do not know whether the actual Warsaw boy perished or not. Over years, more than one person has claimed to be he. It hardly matters. In the, day of, in the, in the world of today's famous images, the Warsaw ghetto boy is as iconic as the Mona Lisa of Da Vinci, as the sunflowers of Van Gogh, as Warhol's Marilyn, if not more so. His image screams louder than Munich's scream. He is the Jewish crucifixion. His hopeless figure is more captivating than Chagall's Jew nailed to a cross with a prayer shawl tied around his loins and the images of desolation that surround him. Because of all that, the much-published 
trivialized and at times particularly abused photograph of the Warsaw boy has become to me a source of inspiration. With his arms lifted in an attitude of resignation and surrender and his depleted gaze focused on my eyes, he never stops questioning me. Perhaps I should assure you that he is well and alive and that he has recently moved into my studio and there he functions as my life model. But getting him into the paintings wasn't an easy task. On my part, it demanded some maturation as well as courage. Just the popularity and overexposure of his image made me reluctant. But there was a personal bond between him and me, and it was of consequence. In the Vilna ghetto, I was his age, and I looked, as did thousands of other children, destined for the same fate, exactly like him. Same cap, same outgrown coat, same short pants. I always consider this picture a kind of portrait of myself in those times. This may be a presumptuous thought, since, as I said, we do not know if the authentic boy survived, whereas I did. However, his tragic figure that represents more than a million, a million and a half of murdered Jewish children, radiates an aura of holiness. For a long time I studied this sacred image, lived in its presence, but was afraid to make it part of my pictorial world. Its authenticity had an incredible power. I dared not challenge it. Besides, I have always found insufferable those books, movings, and paintings that sentimentalize the Holocaust. And I feared this boy as if he were a trap. The passing of time made me reconsider. The Western world began erecting monuments to the Holocaust. Many such projects are still in the making. Some are impressive, but many are puzzling, if not painfully inadequate. The magnitude of the subject often defeats our creativity. Moreover, memorials that speak specifically to a given generation usually become dated. At times, the location chosen for them undergoes profound changes. I began to wish for monuments that would be temporary, or at least transportable. I knew that in reality such monuments could not exist, but I could paint them. The Warsaw Boy came to my help. In order to reflect more deeply on all those complex issues, I decided to paint him in a series of small canvases that would be dedicated to his memory. I painted impossible memorials, tombstones of swords, humble and perishable reliquaries made of rubble, cutouts and throwaways. All of them called up his ghost-like presence. Such, such were the only tangible markings of memory that I could produce. Thus, the boy from Warsaw, my new friend, this alter ego of mine began emerging in my canvases, and suddenly I painted him again and again, and with time I began to feel that not 15 or 20 such imagined tombstones should arise in those non-existent cemeteries, but an entire million, a million and a half. In the last 15 years, I have painted over 100 such canvases. Some remain small, others expand in size. Can one give individual faces to such a multitude of children? I tried first in my mind, sometimes on my canvases. Whenever I look at these paintings, I see in them my closest childhood friend, Samek Epstein. We were born the same year, and we both bore the same diminutive of the Hebrew name Shmuel or Samuel, which in Polish became Samek. In 1941, during the Nazi occupation of Vilna, the Lithuanian police discovered the eight-year-old Samek hiding in the home of a Christian woman. They dragged him to the courtyard and shot him. His body was left for hours in a puddle of blood as a warning to any other Jew who might try to remain outside the ghetto. It is vain of me to hope that through my art I can somehow live now 
for the two of us, for Samek and myself. And in this way, his obliterated future will not have been totally lost. Alive in my mind and work, he and the ghetto boy helped me safeguard the memory of all those martyred children, the entire million and more. And as I say, the more time passes, and the more I see how very little the world is ready to learn from past mistakes, the more this boy transcends the Jewish tragedy and ends up representing a universal one. Mourning is a universal experience. The loss of a child, a parent, a spouse, or a friend, these are forever shattering events. But holding on to the memory of a given face, personality, or story, cementing into one's memory a specific web of relationships, these acts afford some kind of afterlife to those who are gone. Our ability to remember gives us pain, but also consolation. And it helps us to accept grief. When people deal with inevitable loss, established rituals can help. Sharing one's sorrow with others helps to ease it. The well-known tradition of the Shiva, the Jewish seven days of mourning, helps people to acknowledge their bereavement. It is very different when one is faced with the need to mourn the loss of thousands or millions. The Shoah exposes us to this test. The most attentive commemoration of historical facts and the richest collection of artifacts cannot help us to integrate what our human conscience refuses to accept. Let us not forget that the pounding of the machine of our subconscious isn't that very easily oiled or appeased. I believe that just as the destruction of the temple has created in the Jewish culture and religion a body of clearly defined public rituals of mourning, so today's art, literature, and music may well seek to provide openings for the collective awareness of a loss that defies all rational explanation. I am looking at the sad eyes of my friend from Warsaw, and I think that he agrees with me. Let me conclude with just this little thought. Um, a big exhibition of my work will open in the Holocaust Museum of Florida in uh, March of next year, but this year, in uh, my gallery in Boston, there is an exhibition of 36 paintings of the boy of Warsaw. After I send these 36 paintings, because this is the size of the, of the gallery, I realize suddenly 36, Lamed Vav, Lamed Vav, 36 just men, Lamed Vav Sadikim, these are my, the little just boys. Uh, I was even surprised by, by the choice of the of the, of the number. But then I realized something else that was in it. Lamed Vav. It, it is in Hebrew, Lamed Vav, which is 36, it is in Hebrew also Lamed Vav. Teach about the six. And this has uh, touched me very profoundly, and I think that this is your job. Thank you very much.